Hi everybody, welcome to naming covalent or molecular compounds. So today we're going to talk about how we, what a co covalent or a molecular compound is, how it's bonded and how it's different from an ionic compound, and then we'll finish up by talking about how you name them or write their formulas. So the first thing we have to talk about is what are the properties of a covalent compound? So usually it is two nonmetals bonded together. Now we're going to use this as a, a shorthand way. The correct way is to actually look at the electronegativities of the two elements that are being bonded, but we're just going to stick to a general rule that says if two things are nonmetals, that they will have covalent bonds between them. Um, this means that the two nonmetals are going to share their electrons fairly equally between the two of them. So if they both have roughly equal electronegativities, then when they pull on those electrons, it'll be basically equal. So there'll be sharing going on. Um, generally, covalent bonds or, or covalent materials are gases or liquids at room temperature. If they are a solid, they're usually a squishy solid like a wax or say like something similar to butter. Um, if they are solid, they'll have low melting points and the liquids will have low boiling points. And they generally don't conduct electricity well. And we can say that they're not as a whole very soluble in water, although that's kind of disingenuous. Um, whenever you talk about solubility, there's a lot of things going on there. But for the whole, let's say that in general, covalent materials don't dissolve as well as ionic ones do. So let's do a rough uh, comparison. If there's a metal in the inside the material, it's we're going to say that it's ionic. Again, this is a rough thing, and what you should actually be doing is looking at the electronegativities of the two atoms. But for us, we're going to stick with if there's a metal and a nonmetal, then we're talking about an ionic bond. If it's two nonmetals, then it's going to be covalent bond. Covalent bonds share electrons because the electronegativities are close together. So the pull is fairly equal, where between a metal and a non-metal, um, we're talking about a, a completely different strength of pull, and so the electrons actually get transferred. Um, generally, ionic materials are solid at room temperature, where covalents are solid, liquid, or gas. Um, and the melting point's very different, as we talked about before. And another big key is that ionic materials will conduct electricity when melted or dissolved. Okay, so if we have this covalent material, how, if we had a super powerful microscope, how can we tell that we were looking at a covalent compound? And you could tell because covalent compounds form molecules. And what we mean by a molecule is that there are groups of atoms that are bonded together, so they're sharing their electrons, and the sharing of electrons between those atoms um, forms a really tight hold between one another, much tighter than you would see between one molecule and another molecule. So I'll give you a married couple analogy. Um, married couples, you can see them holding hands in the picture there, that they're tightly bonded together so that like, they love each other so much and they're completely internally focused between the two. Now, does that mean they don't pay attention to other couples? No, they'll pay attention to other couples, but their bond to other couples should be weaker than the bond that they have be between themselves. So if you go to a party, you should still be able to kind of pick out who's married to whom by the way that they're standing together or like what kind of physical contact they're making. And you can clearly say, oh look, these two people belong together and these two people belong together as couples, as a molecule. Okay. Okay. So how are covalent compounds different in terms of structure? Well, we talked about before that an ionic compound is made up of these individual ions that are attracted to all the other ions inside that um, group. So as you can see down below, uh, we've got different um, ions, positive and negative ions that are all regularly arranged in a pattern where all the positives are attracted to all the negatives that are surrounding them. So you can think about this kind of like a dance where you have a whole bunch of single people and they're all very attracted to everyone that's around them. Okay, if we go to a covalent material, we're talking about married couples again. So are those couples attracted to the people around them? Sure, that's why they're at this party. But there's a difference. The married couples are internally bonded so that 
the bond between the two mar the married man and the married woman is really strong compared with the bond that the couples have between each other. Now we need to learn to name covalent materials. So if they come as a molecule, we have to use a totally different system to name them than we would if they were ionic. So ionic compounds, remember, we didn't pay attention to the numbers at all. We would just say, okay, name the metal, name the nonmetal, and put an IDE at the end. But when you're talking about covalent or molecular um, compounds now, we're going to use a set of prefixes to name them. So briefly, you can see the list on the left that um, if you want to tell someone that uh, there's one atom in something, you're going to call it mono, two means di, three is tri, four is tetra, and then from there, most people know their polygons, so you have a pentagon, a hexagon, a heptagon, an octagon. So we'll use that same pattern. Let's do the first one as an example. We all know that CO2 is actually called carbon dioxide. So let's look at the, the, the pattern here. We've got carbon and there's one carbon, right? So the first question is, why don't I call that monocarbon dioxide? So we're going to come up with a rule, and the first rule we're going to come up with is that we never start a name with mono. What I always tell my students is, look, if on the first date, your date looked across the table at you and said, I have mono, that would be it. You would, you'd be done. So we never start with mono. It's a bad idea. Okay? Can you have mono in the middle of a name? Sure. But the very first thing cannot be mono. Okay, so where does the dioxide come from? Well, the prefix di means that we have two, and we have two of the oxygens. So that's where the ox comes from. And just like with ionic compounds, we are going to end every one of these with an IDE uh, suffix. So we're going to end it with IDE. Okay, so those will be our two rules. One, we can't start with a mono. Two, you'll shorten the second um, element and put IDE in as its ending. Okay, so give the other ones a try. N2O, B2H6, CH4, and NH3. Pause the video for a second, scribble out some names, and then we'll see how we did. How'd you do? Carbon dioxide, we already went through that one. The second one is dinitrogen monoxide. So again, here's our mono, and I said we could put a mono in the middle of a word, we just can't start with it. And the, how many oxygens are there? There's one oxygen. So why did we start with a di? Well, the di is, it refers to the nitrogen, and because we have two nitrogens, dinitrogen monoxide. Then we have diboron hexahydride. So the di means we have two borons, and the hexa that we have six hydrogens. Okay, the other two, carbon tetrahydride, actually goes by a common name. It's an organic molecule, so it has a completely different naming system, which we won't get into. But I need you to hold on to this name. Carbon tetrahydride actually goes by the name methane. So you'll see this over and over again in the couple, next couple of units. Um, likewise, nitrogen trihydride also has a common name, and it goes by ammonia. So don't be surprised when in the next few units they keep referring to ammonia, and you're just supposed to know that ammonia is nitrogen trihydride, or NH3. I also want to point out that there is an ion that is NH4+, plus, and this is the ammonium ion, which is different from ammonia. Ammonia has no charge. It's a compound where um, the ammonium ion is an NH4 plus ion. It's got a plus one charge. Let's say we turn this around and we're going to learn to write formulas if I give you the name. So the first thing we need to do is take a look at carbon monoxide and figure out what are the elements involved. So carbon's easy, that's a C. But the monoxide part, you can't find a monoxide on the periodic table. So we need to remember that there are prefixes and suffixes in there. So the IDE ending is just a standard ending, so we don't need to pay attention to that. The mon, or the mono, is going to be our suffix telling us that there is one. So that leaves us with the ox part. And oxygen, or ox is short for oxygen, so we know that our other element is going to be an O. So now we need to look at what will be our subscripts, our numbers. Well, the mon means one, so that'll be one oxygen. But how many carbons do I need? There's no prefix there. 
So you have to remember back then, rule number one was we never start with a mono. So if in the very first element has no prefix, that means that we're going to leave it as a one. Now, we never write ones. Uh, it's just like in math class, nobody writes one x, okay, or x to the first. So if you need to write a one, you just leave it alone, and we'll cross that out, and we'll say that it is carbon monoxide, CO. Let's skip down one and do silicon tetrachloride. So the silicon is easy, that's our SI, and the tetra is a prefix, that means four, and the chloride here, we've got chlor and I, the chloride is going to be a CL. So if we've got chlorine, how many chlorines do we have? Well, we've got a tetrachloride, so that means we have four chloride, chloride ions. Um, how many silicon? Again, there's no prefix, so it must be a one, and we'll leave it as SiCl4. So pause the video now and take a couple minutes to write formulas for sulfur trioxide, diphosphorus pentachloride, and tetraphosphorus triselenide. We'll check back. Okay, how'd you do? Now, the tricky part there was the triselenide. Most people are not used to selenium as an element, so selenide, where does that come from? Remember, you're going to take the element, drop off the ending, and add IDE. So when you go backwards, you have to say, well, selen, oh shoot, what's that? Well, what would go with cella, and just start to look up the cella on the periodic table and see what you run across. I'm going to end this short video this time by looking at some additional ones that I'm going to give you. So I'm going to have you name uh, four compounds, CBr4, N2O5, MGF2, and SES. And then I want you to write formulas for the, the, the compounds that are listed below. But uh, be very careful. I've thrown some compounds in there that don't fit the pattern. And I want you to go through and say, ooh, I can name these as covalent materials, or no, I can't name them this way, or I can't write a formula this way. And try and explain to yourself why you can't. So leave comments in the section below. Talk to each other. See what you can tell other people about what you've learned about naming. Good luck.